on the show. All this week, our series Front and Center has been looking at a business model known as franchising. So that's what we're talking about this first hour. Why? Well, for one reason, U.S. franchise jobs have outpaced job growth overall for 12 months in a row. Here in Illinois, there are almost 345,000 franchise jobs. Many say franchising is an efficient model that's good for consumers, but this way of business has also come under fire. Recently, in particular, a union-backed movement has been organizing minimum wage protests outside franchise stores. Some franchisees, who are almost always small business owners, say they're feeling squeezed between their workers and the big corporations above them. That's led to some franchise owners to push for limits on how these brand name companies treat them. Today, we've lined up a whole host of people to talk about this. Franchise owners, the International Franchise Association, unions and labor experts. And as always, we want to hear from you. Are the franchises in your neighborhood, the ones owned by small business owners, are they good or bad for the local economy? To help us get started, let's hear from some of the people we've already profiled this week. We met for lunch, we started talking. Next thing you know, he talked me into franchise business. <laughs> a franchisee will do a, the best job. Instead of a large company having a bunch of managers that are running the stores, a franchisee buys into the system, it becomes their business, it becomes their life. You don't have to go and be like, test 20 different burgers to see which one you want to sell. They've already done that. And that's good for consumers. The problems arise in many cases for the workforce. <laughs> That worker who is working also thinks, and I know it for a fact, that I am just greedy. We are as much of a victim in it as the workers are. No, a franchisee is going to be an independent operator, so they're going to be solely responsible for employing people and determining what they pay those people as well. Cada mes me quitan el 20% de lo que yo gano. It's a scam. CleanNet is trying to say we're not their employer. Those are some of the experts for excerpts from this week's series, Front and Center, which is funded by the Joyce Foundation, improving the quality of life in the Great Lakes region and across the country. Those reports were from WBEZ's Shannon Heffernan and Chip Mitchell, who are joining me now. Shannon, Chip, thanks for being here. Thank Good you. Good afternoon, Isla. Again, if you're wondering, those of you listening, how does this affect me? Well, next time you pull up to a drive through window or pick up your dry cleaning or book a hotel, there's a good chance you're supporting this franchise economy. So for those folks listening out there, this is the number, this is what we want you to weigh in on. Are the franchises in your neighborhood, the ones owned by small business owners, do you think they're good or bad for the local economy? The number 312-923-9239. If you're on Twitter, you can use the hashtag afternoon shift to chime in. Shannon and Chip, let's start with the basics on this. We hear the word franchising a lot. What qualifies as a franchise? Well, that's actually a pretty simple explanation. So there's a big company and what well, sometimes small but there's a there's a company and they decide they have a really good thing going they got a great product and people love it and they want to expand um, and so they look to people who want to open their own versions of the store. And the reason people tend to do that is it's a good chance for them to become a small business owner and um, with a model they know works and get some support. What? And for the big Go company, ahead, for the big company, they they may need the franchisee, the the small business owner, because they they're not familiar with all the different places that they may want to expand to, and they may actually, in some cases, actually need the capital, the buy in from the small businesses as well. Chip, I mentioned earlier that franchisee employment, uh, the jobs in Illinois measures around 345,000. Can you give us a sense of what that means in terms of how big that is for our economy here in Illinois? Well, in uh, in Illinois, um, there, <laughs> it's, it's, it's roughly, depending on where you get the numbers, um, from the census and from ADP, we're, we're, we are the, we're about 6%, and, and that's roughly about the same as the national economy. Um, franchise jobs nationwide wide now total more than 8.1 million. That's according to ADP, the big payroll processor. And as you mentioned, Nyla, this jobs growth in uh, by franchises, franchise jobs growth has outpaced jobs growth in the economy as a whole for 12 consecutive months now. So that's one, I think, very obvious answer to why uh, we're doing this series. What else was behind why you guys decided to do this? Well, I, one of the things is we were both covering um, some of the walkouts that happened recently. You'll remember this, minimum wage workers walking the out of their 15. jobs, the fight for 15. Mm-hmm. And um, I started to realize, you know, I haven't talked much to the people who are actually signing the checks for these folks. What are they thinking about a minimum wage hike? Is it actually possible? 
So we started calling some of those folks and we realized that most of them are small business owners. A lot of them are franchisees. And it turned out what was going on for them was way more complicated than we expect it to be. So we got really curious and started digging in. All of those stories are online at WBEZ.org. We'll tweet the link out as well. Actually, oh, they already have tweeted. If you follow WBEZ Afternoon, uh, their stories, we've uh, been tweeting them out so you can see uh, Shannon and Chip's stories. Thanks, you guys. Uh, I wanted to bring in now, Shannon, you were mentioning franchise owners. I introduced a couple other folks into the conversation. One of them is Matthew Patankin. He has 60 Auntie M's pretzels, most in the Chicago area. I'd also like to Welcome to the afternoon shift, Sean Kelly. He's editor of the website Unhappy Franchisee and Matthew Haller with the International Franchise Association. So Matthew, Sean, Matthew, welcome to the afternoon shift. Thank you. Thanks. Great to be here. Matthew Patankin, can you share with us a little bit about uh, your experience as a franchise owner, how you ended up in this, and how you see the franchise owner relationship with the companies that you are franchising from? Sure. Uh, thanks, Nyla. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Uh, I really do listen to your show. I enjoy it and glad to be here. Well, thanks. Um, you know, so, so I think my entry into franchising is probably like many other franchisees. I, I grew up in the retail industry, and we owned uh, stores. I started working in those stores, doing everything I could. This company grew. I eventually became the head of all stores, and I frequently traveled to our locations. And along the way, I came across an Auntie Anne's pretzel store, which now was probably back in 1992 or three. I loved the product. I knew they were a franchise, and... It was about the time I was looking to do something else with some other business partners, so we knew we had a lot of experience, and we um, we just didn't know how to make pretzels, and we didn't know what kind of equipment to buy or, or, or how to market it or anything, so we decided to become a single-store Auntie Anne's franchisee just to see if we could succeed. And if we did, we hoped to grow the company, and so that store did work. We opened a second store, and over the last 20 years, uh, I'm really proud to say that we've grown as much as we have. You said we have 60. We actually have about 65 stores, most here in Chicago. And, you know, it hasn't always been easy. Uh, We suffer when the economy suffers. We've made some mistakes, but I feel like what we have accomplished is terrific. We have um, over 600 employees, uh, and we just never could have done this ourselves. We needed the training and the support of a franchise system. Uh, let alone the brand recognition. So I'd say that the franchise industry has clearly worked for us. I'm a happy franchisee and uh, hope we can open more stores. And, and now that you said you're a happy franchisee, Matthew, I feel like I have to bring Sean Kelly into the conversation because he's editor of the website Unhappy Franchisee. Sean, how did your website come about? How did you end up caring so much about franchising and naming your website Unhappy Franchisee? Well, this this is really uh, ironic that uh, Matthew Patinkin uh, started off the show. But I didn't know that he was going to be on. But actually, my background goes back to um, I was one of the the first management staff of Auntie Anne's uh, Soft Pretzels, and I was uh, actually the director of marketing when the Patinkin Group came on, and when Matthew Patinkin came on. Well, hi, Sean. Hello. It's been a long time, but I'm glad to hear you're doing so great. Thank you. And, you know, what Matthew tells you is, um, you know, I came out of a consulting background where I was vice president of a consulting company that put together new franchise programs. And in the late 80s and early 90s, we launched um, 150 to 200 different new franchise programs. And I I was based in Chicago, listened to WBEZ, and then when I... uh, uh, when I came across Annie Ann's, um, several of us, three of us at that company, fell in love with the, the people and the product and the vision and moved out to Pennsylvania to help found that company and uh, be sort of half of the management staff, along with the original family, which actually was uh, Amish raised out in Lancaster County. And, you know, we really did all of the things that uh, we imagined franchise companies should do at the time. You know, everything that we did was focused on making the franchisees succeed. And, um, you know, we had the, the great fortune of having really good uh, franchisees like the Patinkins in, in Chicago and in the Midwest. And uh, But the company would do anything uh, to help the franchisees succeed. And when I was um, on there, there were no restrictions. I could, 
you know, if somebody was in trouble, I would I would go out to the store and do what I could do to help. Um, and so, I, I Sean, when did you when did you switch views? Because it sounds like you are. Do you have a different opinion about franchisees now? Yeah, I had a rude awakening um, because from the consulting company and from Annie Ants, I really thought the rest of the industry was operating like this. Um, so a few years later, after I left, um, I started a blog um, called Franchise Pick, and it was, you know, going to be a you know happy, you know, franchise blog. You know, here's how you can you know become your own boss and go into this business, and here's the way to find the right opportunity for you. And I was going to make a lot of money, you know, selling franchise advertising. And uh, what I learned was that the rest of the industry was not operating according to that ideal. And, you know, the IFA and Matthew will will talk in uh, Entrepreneur Magazine, and a lot of the industry puts up this front that uh, every franchise is like the way we were at Annie Ann's. Uh, But the reality is I was inundated with really sad you know, and just really disturbing stories from. What do you see as the biggest um, points of conflict, Sean? What what are, what what kind of stories are you talking about? You know what what you find is that the franchisor and the franchisee have very uh, different motivations in terms of um, for a franchise to work. The franchisor really needs to have uh, the franchisee's best interest at heart. Um, there's sort of a myth that franchisors can't succeed unless their franchisees succeed. Um, but there are a lot of other franchisors that um, uh, that I found and that were reported to me um, and stories I had to confront about people who were much more predatory, um, who were actually making a living setting up franchises um, that they knew were going to fail or that they actually intended to fail. And then they would do what's called churning they would you know resell those same territories uh, to new franchisees and uh and turn a new profit um there were other ones that were just very incompetent and just very um uninterested or uh, not worried about their franchisee's success and didn't have priority then Sean Kelly, he's the editor of the website Unhappy Franchisee. Uh, franchise owner uh, Matthew Patankin is also with us, along with Matthew Holler from the International Franchise Association. Matthew Holler, uh, what Sean's describing, uh, your organization, perhaps you can uh, fill our listeners in on your role and what the IFA does in helping uh, kind of coordinate for the, for the franchise model world. Thanks, Nyla. It's great to be with you today and appreciate the opportunity to address uh, some of the things you all have been reporting on this week. Um, the IFA itself is a, is a trade association. We're based in Washington, D.C. We've been around for a little over 50 years, and our core mission is to protect, promote, and enhance franchising at, at all levels. And we do that through lobbying and government relations. We do that through talking to good folks like yourself about you know things people hear about franchising and and how to get into franchising and and uphold the the standards of franchising and the business model itself. And we do it through education. We do industry conferences. We do trade shows around the country uh, where franchisors are offering uh, franchise opportunities to the the public and and educate people about all the opportunities that exist in franchising. Matthew uh, Holler, just uh, we're going to take a break in just a few minutes, but before that, I just wanted to ask you uh, about how you see these changes you know we started this conversation uh shannon and ship were saying that there's we're there have been you know these protests for minimum wage and the fight for 15 from the perspective of your trade group how do you think uh changes in minimum law and minimum wage laws would affect your members well i think you know ifa is on the record as being opposed to the to the minimum wage increase and you know, look, companies pay employees wages that are competitive in the markets where they operate, and the vast majority, you know, make above the minimum wage. Um, so, you know, we oppose minimum wage for a variety of reasons. It impacts jobs, um, it impacts opportunities, and it negatively impacts employees, honestly, at the end of the day. So happy to talk uh, more about that in the next segment, if you'd like. Matthew uh, Patinkin, uh 
with you, I, I don't know how you feel about uh, the, and we're going to get into this a little bit more after the break, but with these minimum wage laws, obviously that would be something your, you, be your responsibility to pay, as you said, for the more than 600 people who work for you at your stores. How would, changes, how would those changes affect you? Well, well, first of all, I mean, I support minimum wage laws. I appreciate the reason why those laws were enacted in the first place. However, it's important to recognize that every time any expense goes up, it has an impact. And whether it's rent or cost of goods or, you know, health care or wages, when the costs go up, something's got to give. And so I want our employees to take on more responsibility, to move up the ladder, to earn more money. And these are basic things, uh, and I support that. But, you know, everyone who owns a business is always trying to keep our costs down. And as franchisees, we own the business, not the franchisor. I think there is a, and you stated earlier, Nyla, there's a misconception that um, if the minimum wage goes up and some municipalities are pushing a $15 minimum wage, it will impact the big companies, the McDonald's of the world. But that's just not true. Uh, We as individual franchisee owners bear the brunt of that. And so it's a very challenging thing when any line item on our P&L goes up by 30, 40, 50 percent. And so I am uh, challenged to suggest that it makes me comfortable. Uh, I would like to see a consistent plan uh, across the board. Matthew Patankin, do you think that uh, with if these changes happened, one thing we haven't talked about is franchise agreements and the relationship that you have um, with whom you bought the franchise from. Do you think that if there were changes in minimum wage laws, that would force a change in franchise agreements? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, obviously, the um, franchise agreements that exist are, are very robust. <laughs> you know, they are hundreds of pages in some cases. Oh, is that what you mean by robust? They're long? Yeah, <laughs> is that they ro- are. Okay. <laughs> they are, um, you know, the amount of regulation in the franchise industry is already greater than most industries. I, I think um, I would suggest that it, who, anyone who's in favor of less government intervention would probably be horrified by the amount of government regulation that exists in the franchise world. But that said... Um, you know, to me, the franchise, the FDD, as it's called, is one of the most transparent, helpful documents you could ever ask for. Uh, I may not like 100% of what's in there, but it lays out the terms very clearly of the agreement, which we have with the franchisor. You know, what responsibilities the franchisor has, what responsibilities we as a franchisee have, and... Um, So I value the FDDs and uh, look forward to them. I'm I'm, I'm honestly not sure if the any changes in the minimum wage law would specifically impact an FDD. I think they're probably uh, separate. There is no um, uh, uh, um, section in the FDD that I can think of which actually addresses minimum wage laws. And I'm sorry, F E depth of franchise. That's the agreement. The F. I'm sorry. The The FDD FDD is is the disclosure document. Disclosure document. And what's that? That is the big document which franchise companies, franchisors, are responsible for producing on an annual basis. It includes a wealth of information about all of the fees, all of the expenses, all of the expectations, all of the requirements, and it's really um, very, very uh, lengthy. Uh, I can point out a couple things that I think are wonderful about them. Uh, for example, let me mention that... Are there things that aren't wonderful about them? Things that aren't wonderful? Well, one of the sections is uh, item 19. I think almost any franchisee knows what that is, which talks about the financial aspect of the franchise system. And item 19, depending on uh, the franchisor, can have more or less information in it. So it's not that it will include every single franchisee in the system and how they do. Having said that, how many other industries can you find which give you even a limited amount of information? And what's beautiful about the FDD, in my opinion, and I've looked at many of them for many brands, is that they include in them a list of all the existing franchisees in the system. So I can pick up the phone and call any of them and ask them about their experiences. And perhaps even more important, the FDD also lists 
all of the franchisees who have left the system. So I can call them and say and ask why they left. What were they disappointed about? That is a real advantage. And that That's. Was, a, I'm afraid we're going to have to take a break. So I'm going to just ask that. Uh, thank. I want to thank uh, Matthew uh, Patankin, Sean Kelly, and Matthew Holler. We're going to keep this conversation going uh, after the break. Keep the calls coming. I see we're going to get to some of the calls because I see some of them. Three one two nine two three nine two three nine. And the afternoon shift will continue in just a few minutes. More of the afternoon shift on WBEZ. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Melba Lara. Support for this program comes from WBEZ members and State Farm. 1-800-STATE-FARM or statefarm.com. State Farm, get to a better state. And by Walcott School in Chicago, a college prep high school for students with learning differences. Currently accepting 9th, 10th, and 11th grade applications. More info at walcottschool.org. And by the Second City Training Center, offering classes for all ages in improv, writing, acting, stand-up, summer immersions, and and more. More information at secondcity.com slash TC. Right now it's traffic. Here's Sarah Engel. Delays on many of our roads early on, Mel, by the Edens, however, is one of our only delay-free expressways. The Kennedy out to Montrose 12, downtown to O'Hare 25, inbound Montrose on in 17 minutes, O'Hare to downtown 27. The Eisenhower headed out to Wolf 21, further to Thorndale 34, inbound Wolf on in 16, Thorndale on in 32. The Stevenson outbound out to the Tri-State 27, all the way to 355, a 35 five-minute ride. Inbound on the Stevenson is moving well. The Dan Ryan, 15 minutes out to 95th Street. Inbound, you're looking at 17 minutes on up to downtown. Lakeshore Drive is moving well. I'm Sarah Engel, WBEZ. In South Texas, a massive oil boom is rapidly transforming a rural, impoverished region. Local leaders hope it can bring the jobs and infrastructure they've longed for. I've always called it wanting to be normal, you know, having what other communities have. In my lifetime, we're never going to see another opportunity. The Eagle Ford Shale, later on All Things Considered, from NPR News. Listen in today after 4 o'clock. It's 63 degrees. I'm Alba Lara with WBEZ News Headlines. Federal prosecutors in Chicago say a high-ranking member of Mexico's Sinaloa cartel and the son of one of the drug ring's leaders is now cooperating with authorities. Jesus Vicente Zambada Niebla pleaded guilty to drug trafficking a year ago. Zambada was indicted in Chicago and arrested in Mexico City in 2009. Also captured, uh, rather named in the indictment, is the cartel's leader, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, who was captured in February. Swedish retailer IKEA is investing in an Illinois wind farm. IKEA, which has stores in Schaumburg and Bolingbrook, says it wants to produce enough power to offset its needs within six years. The wind farm is located 150 miles south of Chicago. The Chicago Public Library launched a new website today that allows cardholders to download free magazines and movies. Users will be able to use their library card number to access various media through the Zinio and Hoopla services. Magazine downloads through Zinio will be unlimited. Movie downloads through Hoopla will be capped at four a month. Our forecast today, clouds with afternoon rain, a high near 63. This is WBEZ. This is the afternoon shift on WBEZ. I'm Nyla Boodoo. We're talking franchising as part of a series of stories we've been doing with our front and center project this week, looking at the franchising model. The question that we're asking all of you folks listening out there is about the franchising model in terms of the folks that are in your neighborhood, the ones that are owned by small business owners. Do you think they're good or bad for the local economy? That's part of what we're discussing here today on the afternoon shift. My colleague Chip Mitchell is here in studio with me. We've been speaking to folks from the International Franchise Association, and I'd like to welcome Jay Perrin. Now he's the Vice President for Government Relations and Public Policy uh, with the IFA, along with Catherine Ruckelshaus. She's a General Counsel and Program Director at the National Employment Law Project. Catherine, Jay, thanks for joining me. Sure. Nice to be here. Same here. Thank you so much. 312-923-9239. If you'd like to join us, Josh in Indiana, you're on the air. Yes, hi. I'm I'm Josh Brown, and I'm actually a franchise attorney uh, with my own practice in Indiana, uh, specifically at the 
in the Carmel area. And um, I definitely believe that it has a positive impact on the economy. I mean, for one thing, the people who uh, become the franchisee owner-operators are able to create jobs in the local community. And another, I mean, I've seen in in different areas, for instance, uh, veterans who are coming back after serving uh, have many opportunities to get into franchise ownership when they otherwise may not have had other small business ownership experience. But I think the, a very, very important aspect of franchising that often gets looked over is that it is so important to make sure that the right person becomes a franchisee owner-operator. So often I see that people go into franchising who should never be in franchising. You know, the So, Josh, yeah, thanks for that point. And I, it's interesting that you say that in terms of uh, people who are involved in franchising, because what I actually wanted to f- shift the focus of the conversation a little bit was to uh, people involved in franchising from the worker standpoint. And the notion, as you know, we were talking about how part of why this series started was looking at people and minimum wage and the union-backed uh, campaigns, the Fight for 15 that has been talking particularly about franchising owners. Uh, fr- Catherine, from the National Labor Employment Law Project's perspective, I just, as Josh was talking about people, and I'm thinking about our labor laws and sort of the whole notion of them applying to the model of an economy when one person worked for a big company, it was a direct relationship. With franchising, we see that relationship maybe a little do we see that relationship changing at all? Is it a little more indirect? Yes. If you're talking about the, the corporation, the brand, um, there definitely is a, a one step removed between the, you know, the workers, say, at a McDonald's and McDonald's Corporation because there's the, the franchise operator is, is in between them. And we're seeing those structures, you know, all over the economy. And I don't think they're necessarily bad. The only time they're bad is, uh, if the workers are being squeezed at the bottom and they're not they're not uh, getting fair pay or um, other labor standards that they're entitled to. And, well, and we've seen some research, and I'm thinking in particular of David Weil's research. I know he's, uh, I think actually his confirmation hearings are maybe today for being uh, head of wage and hour divisions for the Department of Labor, but I was reading some of his research about, particularly in the fast food industry, that it seems that there is more evidence of wage and hour violations among franchise owner, f- franchise owner uh, workers in those industries working for franchise owners is that the are you also seeing that or are there cases with that yeah i mean i think with in fast food generally there is a lot of wage theft which is you know just another word for underpaying or or mispaying your workers or requiring them to work off the clock or long hours without paying overtime and again there's nothing inherently in the franchising system that causes that but the problem is is if the franchisees are squeezed too much and they're required to pay high fees or um, per, or comply with certain high standards that maybe the corporation is requiring, sometimes that results in them squeezing their own workers. It, it depends on the franchise. It depends on how well capitalized they are. It depends on the relationship between the corporate brand and the franchise owner. Jay, from the IFA's perspective, again, that's the International Franchise Association, who, who do you think should bear, who should be responsible for labor law violations? Does the corporation have a role, or is it just the franchise owner? Well, it's the franchise owner. I mean, they, they are the ones that are the business owner. They are the ones that are employing uh, the individuals. And just like in any other business, uh, those folks that, that do, the, uh, do, do the employing are the ones that are responsible uh, for their employees. Catherine, do you feel like that uh, system is working? Well, I mean, it's actually the, under, under our wage and hour laws at the state and federal level, there are, it's clear that there can be more than one responsible party. So it could be the franchise owner, the franchisee owners, but it can also be the corporations. It depends on what the relationship is between the corporation and the franchise owners. And if they're sufficiently have operational control over the franchisee, then they can be found to be a responsible pl- employer as well. Can you give us, us examples of cases where that's happened, Catherine? Yeah, I mean, there's 
there's a there's a case in Texas right now that's pending. That's uh, that is it's not a known brand, but it's uh, it's a taco. I mean, a, sorry, a pizza franchise where the the workers were underpaid. Uh, they they couldn't sue the original franchisee owner because they went out of business. Um, they didn't have enough capital to run their business, and that's why they, probably they weren't paying their workers sufficiently. So the workers sued the individual owner of the corporate franchise as well as the corporation franchisor. And that a jury had found in Texas that the franchisor and the individual owner were responsible. There have just been a bunch of class action lawsuits filed against McDonald's that are bringing these, what are often called joint employer claims, where you have more than one potentially responsible employer brought into the lawsuit. Yeah, and there's actually some precedent here right in the state of Illinois. This is Chip Mitchell. I co-reported our series. Um, in Illinois, in the construction industry, and this goes in many states as well, the, there's something uh, that's known as the mechanics lien. And that that is when somebody, uh, uh, a contractor, a subcontractor, a subcontractor's employee is working on a construction site. If this person doesn't get paid for the job, um, there are there is there are legal mechanisms for this person to actually eventually put a lien on the property of of the property owner. So that's several that can be many layers away from this person in ter- terms of contractual relationships. Jay, how do cases like what Chip and Catherine have, have been outlining? How does that affect the franchise model? Well, I think it puts it puts the franchise model in jeopardy. To be honest with you, I think that uh, you know today. Uh, the model is growing uh, in many different facets, just not just in fast food, but there's many other types of brands that are out there. Uh, and if the if the employees become uh, the responsibility of the franchisor, uh, the model will stop growing, and it, it will uh, it certainly will have an effect on the American economy. Do, do you you so you feel like this will break the entire franchising model? That's what you're saying. It could very well. It it calls into question whether banks want to put money into either a franchise or a franchisee. Well, but one one way to think about this is really if you if a franchisor, the corporation, engages in a franchise agreement with a company that's fully capitalized, it can handle it, it knows how to run a business. There's no harm and no foul because there won't be any violations in the in the in the franchise. So so I think it's really about doing the right kind of franchising and not squeezing the franchise owners. I, I, I think those claims of undermining the entire franchise system are a little bit overblown. Catherine, how would you like to see from the National Employment Law pra- um, Project, you know, your general counsel there, what, how would you like to see this relationship look like? I mean, I think most of them, I would, I mean, the people on the phone are the experts about how these arrangements operate, but most of them are complying with the law. Most of them are completely above board. It's a business-to-business relationship where the franchisee is a valid and legitimate business. The, the times that it that it gets undercut and there's a problem is when the franchisee isn't able to run a business and can't make ends meet, so then in turn... Uh, squeezes its workers or does other things to cut corners. And those are the kinds of relationships that shouldn't continue because it's not good for anybody. I think those are the kind of relationships that my next guest uh, is particularly focused on. Damon Silvers, he's the policy director and special counsel for the AFL-CIO. So I want to bring Damon into the conversation as well and have him chime in. Damon, welcome to the afternoon shift. Go ahead. Uh, Great. Uh, Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, I think... uh, when you're talking about franchisees, you've you got to, I think, begin with by understanding that the the real power in the relationship lies with the uh, with the sponsoring company, uh, with the with the big name public company you've all heard of. Um, of. Of course, the franchisee is given some latitude to do some things, but but they are in a completely dependent relationship. And so, if the fran- and so if the if the if the franchisee is is essentially paying people a, a wage that's less than people can live on, it's large. It's it's more than likely because that franchisee doesn't have a lot of choice. It's being told to do it uh, from from uh, from the the, uh, the sponsoring firm and. You know, it's a big problem in our labor law that um, it's very hard for working people to actually get at the negotiating table with the people who actually have the power over what they're paid. Is that so? That's what's behind. Uh, th- that's what's behind you, your campaign in terms of minimum wage. Do you feel like it's really about creating more of a place at the table for these workers? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, it's not it's not my idea. It's those workers' idea. You know, uh, you, 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 uh, I mean, I, I've been in Chicago and and uh, seen the uh, folks, uh, you know, seen the fast food workers, for example, picketing. Uh, uh, on Michigan Avenue, they want an opportunity to negotiate with somebody who actually has some power to negotiate, uh, and uh, the that 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 means the parent, that means the sponsoring company, that means McDonald's Inc. It doesn't mean, you know, the owner of a single McDonald's uh, on Michigan Avenue. Now, th- now that being said, um, you know, the th- there's kind of a there's kind of a pass the buck thing that does go on between you know franchisees and 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 the parent company. Uh, when it's convenient for one to point to the other, they do. Uh, but I think most people who've, uh, you know, most most fast food workers who try to do something about being paid less than a living wage quickly discover that the the real power lies uh, lies at corporate. Damon, you've been talking about this. You know, we've been talking about workers, franchise owners, the franchisor, the company that owns the um, initial franchise. Is there a chance for at least if it the franchise owners and the franchisors to work together? Do you see that happening? Well, you know, that's a really interesting idea. That there actually is, I I think, deep common interest here, which is that the, you know, the 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 the, the franchise owner. Uh, who is a small, typically a small to medium-sized business, and by medium-sized I mean it may not, might not be medium-sized in, in in what you is what your listeners think of medium-sized means like assets of less than a billion dollars, right? So the, the the franchise the franchisee actually kind of has an interest in uh, in having um, a, a, a local labor market where people are paid a living wage, they can come and spend money in their restaurants. Uh, and work but, with the workers too, of course. I'm just, yeah, just talking I, about everybody working together. Do you see that as I a mean, possibility? Well, working. I mean, I, I think that um, in any business, there's an interest in everyone working together. But it, it's got to start with, with a starting point of mutual respect, and mutual respect starts with a living wage. Now, you're paying people who are working in downtown Chicago, you know, eight nine dollars an hour. Uh, you're not paying them a living wage, and, and it's very hard to talk about. Uh, you know, people all working together when basic issues of respect haven't been addressed. That's Damon Silvers. He's a policy director and special counsel for the AFL-CIO. We need to take a break, but coming back, we'll hear what the International Franchise Association thinks about those last comments, and we'll take your calls and questions. 312-923-9239. On Twitter, use the hashtag Afternoon Shift, and we'll continue in just a few minutes. More of the afternoon shift here on WBEZ. WBEZ supported by the Lake County Discovery Museum in Wakanda, presenting Arnold Newman Luminaries of the 20th Century in Art, Politics, and Culture through August 17th with portraits of John F. Kennedy, Salvador Dali, and others. More at lcfpd.org. And by Symphony Center presents Jazz, featuring Grammy Award-winning soul and gospel singer Mavis Staples. Violinist Regina Carter opens with her Southern Comfort on Friday, April 18th at Symphony Center. Information Information at cso.org slash jazz. Right now it's traffic. Here's Sarah Engel. Melba, have an accident on the outbound Bishop Ford at 130th. It's in the two left lanes, jammed off the Dan Ryan. Definitely consider I-57 instead, which is wide open and moving well. Moving up north, the Eden's up to Lake Cook, 16, Lake Cook Road down, 17. The Kennedy out to Montrose, 14 minutes, downtown to O'Hare, 28. Inbound Montrose on in, 21, O'Hare to downtown, 32. The Eisenhower, if you're going out to Wolf, 22, further to Thorndale, 35. Inbound Wolf on in, 16 minutes, Thorndale on in, 33. The Stevenson, out to the Tri-State, 31, all the way to 355, 40 minutes. Inbounds moving well, the Dan Ryan, 15 minutes out to 95th Street, inbound 17 minutes up to downtown. This report is a service of Alexian Brothers Heart and Vascular Institute, where a team of cardiologists and cardiovascular surgeons provide heart care. More information available at alexianbrothersheart.org. Alexian Brothers, our passion is powerful medicine. I'm Sarah Engel, WBEZ. The following is a public service announcement provided by WBEZ. The Gluten and Allergen-Free Expo will be at the Schomburg Renaissance Convention Center April 12th and 13th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. The event will feature entertainment, authors, products, classes, and more with a special area for kids. More information is at gfafexpo.com. This is WBEZ.
It's 63 degrees. I'm Melba Lara with WBEZ News Headlines. Republican State Senator Jim Oberweiss is introducing legislation to raise the minimum wage in Illinois for some workers. Oberweiss, who is running against U.S. Senator Dick Durbin, wants to gradually increase the minimum wage from eight twenty-five an hour to $10 an hour by 2017. But under his proposal, the changes would only apply to workers who are 26 and older. Pacific Gas and Electric is offering a quarter million dollars reward for information about an attack nearly a year ago on phone lines in the power grid in Silicon Valley. The attack occurred just a day after the Boston Marathon bombings. 63 degrees now. That's our high for today. This is WBEZ. Thanks for tuning in to the Afternoon Shift here on WBEZ. I'm Nyla Boodoo. We're talking franchising, the franchising model, workers, wage issues, all of these things on the Afternoon Shift today. My colleague Chip Mitchell is here with me on the line uh, from Washington. Damon Silver is a policy director and special counsel for the AFL-CIO. Also with us, Jay Perrin. He's the vice president of government relations and public policy for the International Franchise Association. Damon, we, I was asking about uh, an opportunity for franchisees and workers to work together before the break and I know you have to go but one last question I just wanted to ask you uh, I know we invited SEIU to also be part of this conversation and they did were not able to join us but do you see uh, unions trying to f- work with franchise owners to try to come to some sort of resolution on these wage issues yeah I mean I, th- I think you know what what fast food workers have been asking from the start here is simply to sit down and negotiate. Right. I mean, obviously, they have a, fast food workers have a demand, which is a living wage. Uh, but the the expectation of what they want is to be able to sit down and negotiate, work something out. Um, the I mean, I'd, I'd be interested to hear, uh, you know, what the spokespeople for the fast food folks and for the the franchisees and but you know, really for the big companies, what what their response is to that? Because you know, in reality, as opposed to the radio show, in reality, the response has been to refuse to negotiate. Jay, parent. Well, I mean, I think negotiate with with whom? I mean, I mean, these the the walkouts that we've what we've seen aren't really actual for fast food workers. Uh, you know, from our experience uh, with talking to these folks uh, that are protesting are are actually mostly uh, you know part of organized labor. They're not actually the fast food restaurant employees. Um, are, are you suggesting that the people who filed National Labor Relations Board complaints for being fired were not actually working when they were fired? I, I don't know about specific issues or so, specific so what you examples, just said is in but fact I think. False. You just totally lied to the audience about, about the truth uh, of the matter, is, which is that the people who pay you have been firing people illegally for exercising their right to strike. I, I, like I said, so, well, Damon, let, Damon, Damon, why don't you let Jay respond to that? I, I don't know about your specific instance that you're talking about. Damon, go ahead. Damon, let, you need to let Jay respond. No, Damon, you need to let Jay respond. Jay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what the specific uh, issue, uh, instance that he's talking about, but I'm talking about an overall uh, campaign here that is not necessarily directed by the actual workers themselves, uh, but or by outside organizations that are trying to, uh, you know, put their stamp on a, on a debate. Yeah. The, the and Jay, from Jay, actual, but as what uh, that issue aside, because I'm sure both of you uh, could keep arguing about that for a while. Uh, the uh, the notion, though, that what you're saying, just to be clear, is that if the workers in this whole minimum wage fight, you're saying that you're it's still not clear who they would be negotiating with. Well, they, if if you're talking about negotiating with your employer uh, and you're a, a an individual working for a franchise franchisee, you would have to negotiate with the franchisee who is the employer. Three one two. That's Jay Perrin uh, from the International Franchise Association. Damon Silvers from the AFL CIO is also with us. Three one two nine two three nine two three nine. I wanted to get to some calls of some folks who've been waiting patiently. Dilip from Southern California, you're on the air. What's your question or comment? Uh, my comment is that I was a Seven Eleven owner for almost nineteen years, up until last December, and as Earlier in the programming that Sean Kelly was mentioning about churning the profit from the franchisor. So in some cases, <clears throat> that thing is true. 
My 7-Eleven was taken and many others in last year or so without any good reason or any good opportunity. What to, was the reason they gave you for why they took the franchise away to leap? They, they gave us a reason like they said we were doing a couponing fraud for a 7-Eleven Slurpee coupon and they were telling us that we did a fraud of $100,000 coupon fraud in one year for Slurpee. And my point is, like, they didn't even give us a chance to negotiate, not negotiate, but to give a right time to not what the word I'm looking for is, like, to enough opportunity to sit down and telling me that, look, we are taking your franchise away because you did this, this, this. On December 5, they called us in and they said, we're going to take your store away for this reason. If you don't give it, We'll file a federal lawsuit. That's Dilip. Yeah, Dilip. Hold on. I think Sean Kelly is actually... I wanted to bring Sean Kelly back into the conversation because you were mentioning him. Sean, are you there? Well, I, wanna, I wanted to mention, this is Chip Mitchell. I co-reported our series. Um, uh, f- franchise owners like this, uh, th- there, there are all sorts of complaints with how they are treated by the big companies, the fran- franchisors, the, the 7-Elevens, the McDonald's, the Burger Kings, and so on. And uh, one of those, uh, once whole set of demands uh, uh, concerns the terms, uh, uh, you know, the, the terms under which a company can terminate the franchise agreement and basically oust the franchise owner. And they're pushing legislation in various states around the country um, that would put that would basically clamp down on on how the big company can can treat the franchise owner. For example, that, that that giving the franchisees the franchise owners sixty days to rectify any problems to clear things up before they're actually removed from their business. Jay, what is the IFA's uh, perspective on that? Well, as uh, Matthew Patinkin said earlier in the show, you know, the franchise uh, the, the franchise model is probably the most. Uh, regulated industry, uh, business model industry in the country. And I'm not really sure that more regulation is needed uh, in order to, to, to solve these disputes. Uh, I think that the uh, relations between franchisees and franchisors uh, can be solved um, uh, between themselves, not necessarily with a government uh, overreaction. Mr. Perrin, I'm curious how you say the most regulated industry because we have th- uh, 33 states. This is according to Dean Heil of your organization, the International Fi- Franchise Association. He says 33 states have no laws at all on franchisee-franchisor relations. What do you mean? Well, I mean, if you look at what the, the FCC, I mean, it's a it's a highly regulated industry. It's not, uh, it's the, the FCC has, has a lot of control over uh, how a franchisor and a franchisee uh, work together. The I'm sorry, F- the, F- the FCC, Jay? Oh, the FTC. I'm oh, sorry. the FTC. The oh, Trade okay. Commission. Oh, right. Okay. Three one two nine two three nine two three nine. You were mentioning regulation, and uh, John in St. Louis is an attorney who wanted to comment on regulation. John, you're on the air. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the IFA is saying that it's highly regulated. The FTC has certain requirements that go in the federal it'd be a franchise disclosure document, but there's absolutely no oversight of that as far as if the franchisor gives inaccurate information that they know is false, there's really nothing that these franchisees can do. They can go to court, which is stacked against them. And, and uh, yeah, there are pushes in all of these states for, for further regulation, which the IFA is fighting. And, and uh, you know, I, I think that the whole concentration of this argument needs to be on that franchisor-franchisee relationship rather than point to the franchisee and say, that you're an independent business and you're responsible for your employees. I mean, you know, that's ludicrous because it's not an even equal relationship. The franchisor has so much more power than the franchisee that, you know, I, I think that that's where the concentration needs to be. Is, is it Thanks for sharing that, John. And I just, well, let me, unfortunately, we're coming close to the end of the hour. So I, what I thought I'd do is uh, just wrap up and ask each of you uh, and if Sean Kelly, I believe, is with us. So, Sean, I was going to ask to you to start. What's one thing you'd like to see changed or preserved in the franchising model as we're talking about this relationship? Sean? Well, I, th- I think one thing that has to change is they have to drop this falsehood and this myth that this is a highly regulated industry. It's, it's just nonsense. 
The uh, 300-page document called the FDD that they talked about earlier is not reviewed by any government agency, and it's uh, basically franchisors. It's up to franchisors to put in there what they want to put in there, and, and even the even the states that regulate franchising don't review it and don't make sure it's accurate. Um, I think that what the IFA needs to do is, is you know, stop uh, playing lip service to representing the franchisees and really drill down and help um, clean out some of the uh, the behavior that's really putting the squeeze on these franchisors because or the franchisees. Um, many of them want to pay more wages and, and they want to pay their employees living wage and give them incentives but they're so squeezed in the middle of this that they just can't afford to do it and stay in business. Jay, how about you from the International Franchise Association? What What's one thing you'd like to see changed or preserved in franchising? Well, I mean, as as you said earlier, I mean, franchising is continuing to grow. The fact of the matter is, uh, you know, we are hiring more people than, uh, you know, the, the economy as a whole. And if you want to change that, if you want to, uh, stop the growth, stop the jobs that we're creating, uh, then you should, you know, think about doing uh, and having more regulations. That's Jay Perrin with the International Franchise Association. I want to thank you as well as Sean Kelly, uh, editor of the website Unhappy Franchisee, uh, my colleague Chip Mitchell and Shannon Heffernan who were with us earlier. Let's try to, let's end with one last call if we can. Dan, you've got 30 seconds to make your point before we end the show. Go ahead, you're on the air. Dan, are you there? Hello? Hi, Dan. Go ahead and make your point briefly. If you Hi, they, I think you had the wrong name. This is Stephen. I don't know how he got Dan, but... Okay, okay. well, Stephen, go ahead. Great, 30 seconds. Uh, number one, I am a franchise owner uh, of multiple franchises, and I think I'm the majority. Um, we're not part of conglomerates, and the last thing we want is more government intervention. Um, I have a great relationship with my franchisor. Uh, a phone call away, a text message away, a email away, and it's one team to try to, to uh, with one vision and one goal to build a company together. We do not need, and I do not want more government intervention uh, with the FDD. That's what my attorneys are for. I'm a business owner. It's my responsibility to make sure that I feel comfortable with the deal that I'm going into. I do not need, nor do I want, the government intervention. Thanks for your thoughts on that, Stephen. Thanks to everyone who participated in the conversation. You're listening to the Afternoon Shift on WBEC.